Welcome to Truth Transistor Radio. This video is part of a series called Once to Die and Then the Judgment. If you haven't started from the beginning, I recommend you go to my channel and find the playlist called Once to Die and Then the Judgment. I get deep into what the Bible says about the sinful condition of man, the way to salvation, and the eternal destination after the judgment. Welcome to part four of this video series where we will be continuing through the doctrines of TULIP. I'm not 100% sure how many we will get to, but uh, I know for sure the next one is Unconditional Election. So you will see the title on the video. So by the time I finish this, I'll know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, from what I'm guessing and thinking through this, Unconditional Election will probably take the entire hour. Um, but I don't think all the letters will, so some of these later we'll be able to combine, but we'll just see how it goes. What I'd like to do first is sort of define some, some terms here. Um, first of all, I would like to define the, the uh, doctrine of unconditional election, and that is that God elects, this is according to their doctrine, that God elects people to save. And that every you know that there's no condition upon that. It's just God arbitrarily picking people to save. That uh, the rest of us deserve hell, so He just kind of leaves us in that, what and gives us what we deserve or them. And then the elect are con, are uh, selected to be saved. So that is kind of the idea of this doctrine. Now, as somebody who's a skeptic, and I, I remember. Uh, in part two, when I talked about systematic theology, I like to look at passages and uh, not assume anything, but see what is the election for and who is it. And, uh, and, and that might give a different idea of what election is about. Now, I've noticed in some of these websites that are proof, you know, support for unconditional election and TULIP in general um, is that they kind of combine words, chosen, called, um, predestined. These are words all used in simultaneous, uh, in their doctrine with election. But is that true? Are these all for the same thing? Now in English, chosen is a synonym to elect. So we can look at that word and see. Um, but what I want to do is not assume that every passage about election is talking about the same thing. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Every passage on the chosen is not talking about the same thing. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, and I don't know if we'll have time to go through every passage, but I want to find the strongest ones in their case. And then the question of their assumption that the election is to be saved or to believe. And um, and I want to want to look at that carefully. Um, is it true that coming to belief in Christ is unconditional? <laughs> and uh, so we're going to look at that here uh, today. Looking at from the Heidelberg Theological Seminary, the doctrine of unconditional election. 12 scriptural proofs, and we're going to see if it really proves this case. So remember, we're going to look at, does the word elect appear, and what is it talking about? Um, that's what we want to, and we don't want to assume that other words mean the same thing, but we may have to do that. It's, you know, we may have to look at chosen as well. I had to go through five verses before I got to one that used the word elect. So that's kind of frustrating, but um, here's the first one that I found on this list, at least. Matthew 24, 22, uh, 24 and 31. I guess they skip around here. Um, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, 
and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, let me just point out here, uh, you can read all of Matthew 24 if you wish. It's about end times or it's about eschatology. And there's different views on that, but I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, it just says that for the elect's sake, it doesn't say how they became elect. So this has nothing to do with unconditional election. It just says that there's elect people. So we don't really know who they are in this passage. So let's look at the next one here. Um, does the word elect appear? Yes. Luke 18, 7. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? All right. I need to get more context on this one. So let's look up this passage. I'm going to start from the beginning, Luke 18, verse 1, on, in the ESV. And he told them a parable of the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Okay, I don't know. <clears throat> so this passage mentions the elect, but it's talking about justice. It's, it's talking about, you know, judgment on them. So it doesn't really say, even if they're like, uh, who it is yet um, of all the verses I've read or, or saw in that list. Um, now, there are the other verses that say chosen, and we may have to go to that to get any concept of this. But this passage, um, I'm looking at it again closely. It just says that, that the righteous judge will give justice to his elect. Um, I guess, the, well, maybe it's the elect that is the victims that he's going to bring justice for. Um, he will give justice to them speedily, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes. See, I, yeah, so I don't really have any idea of who the elect is or what their, you know, how they become elect yet. Skip a few more before I found more verses on that list with the word elect in it. Romans 9, 11. For the children not yet being born, not, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Now that verse isolated seems to be indicating something like unconditional election, but we need to look at the context uh, of that. And Romans 9 is a huge uh, chapter for them. So, um, so yeah, that might be one we have to do a whole study on Romans. Uh, and I would recommend you uh, look up Mike Winger's uh, video on Romans uh, 9 from a non-Calvinist perspective. Um, because you have to dig into the context and all that. Romans 11, 28 and 29, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So I, I just, uh, we need to look at context on these because isolated, especially 9-11, seems to be saying that before anything is, uh, before they're yet being born. But what is it talking about? So let's look at Romans 9 here in a second. 
So we're starting at the beginning of the chapter, but we may have to go back further. So let, let, I'll just tell you that up front. So we're starting in verse 1 of chapter 9 to build some context up to verse 11. I'm speaking, now let me just say this is written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to the Roman Christians. Okay? Uh, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, I believe, and I've heard a lot of teaching on this, that his kinsmen, his brothers, are the Jewish people, because Paul is a Jewish person, and that's what he's talking about here. Um, but we'll, we'll dig into it to make sure that's true. Oh, <laughs> verse 4, they are Israelites, and to them the, belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So it tells us he's talking about the Israelites. Six, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are destined from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had convinced children by one man, man our forefather Isaac, uh, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, and but Esau I hated. Okay, so this is one of their proof texts, and we need to look at what it's talking about here. First of all, going back, um, it says, not all are Israel, not all from Israel belong to Israel. So it's not based upon their DNA that they are God's children. Um, there's something else going on here. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived. Now, you know, let, let's look at Jacob and Esau here for a second. When that passage, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, is used to say that God loves the elect and hates the non-elect. But is that true? We need to look at context here and see. First of all, Paul is quoting a chapter in the Old Testament. So we're looking at the book of Malachi, uh, chapter 1. This is where that phrase was quoted from. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and his and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may, re they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Now, I think that uh, when it's talking about Jacob and Esau, it's actually talking about two countries, which is Edom, the Esau's offspring, or the Edomites, 
and Jacob's offspring are the uh, Israelites. And so, um, and so this is important to note. It's not talking about individuals. So let's go back to Romans. And I want us to look at something very carefully here. The question is, is this talking about election to salvation? Election to be to believe. Let's let's look at this carefully. And not only let's start in verse 10. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing either good or bad. So whatever this is, it is unconditional. In order that God's purpose of election might continue. Okay, so it is talking about election and it is talking about something unconditional. But is it talking about salvation? Uh, so you have to understand the doctrine of unconditional election has to do with salvation. Is this talking about salvation? Not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, um, but yeah, so in this case, it's talking about the older serving the younger. Um, so when it's talking about Jacob, I loved and Esau, I hated, um, it's important to note that hate doesn't always mean what we think it means. And I'll give you uh, an example of that real quick before we go back to this. We're looking at Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, this is Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So I just wanted to use this as an example of hate, meaning comparatively speaking, it's not necessarily hate in the way that we think of it. Now I'd like to go back to the beginning of the chapter again and point out a few things. So uh, when we looked at verse 11, it said that election might stand. Now let's go back and see He's talking about the Israelites, right? And in verse 4, it says, They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. So I believe God chose that people to carry those things out. It doesn't mean that the individuals are all saved. It just means that they have a burden for these things, to carry these things. And also to, well, to them to belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So they were elect to carry all these things that were listed, plus the Messiah, the Christ, which is Jesus. So through them came Christ. So this is not about election for salvation but election to carry these things uh, the, the, that are listed here in verse 4 and into verse 5. Okay, but it is not so the word of God has failed. Why would they think it failed? Um, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So there was some concern that God's chosen people were not, uh, many of them were not following their Christ that was promised to them. And that was a concern. So that's what he's addressing here. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall his offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this next about this next year for this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah has conceived children by one man, our father, our forefather Isaac, though they were not born and had yet done nothing 
either good or bad. Now remember, like I said, uh, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. So they were chosen or uh, for, you know, Jacob was chosen, Esau was not. But this is not about salvation, as we stated in the earlier verses, that God's purpose of election might continue not become not because of works, but because of him who calls. And now the question is, what were they called to? She was told the older will serve the younger. Now, it could be that that was the calling, but I think the calling is what we read in verse 4 and 5 just a minute ago. As, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So, I don't believe this is talking about election to salvation. I believe this has to do with Israel being called as a nation to carry out certain things. And Esau, Esau's descendants would serve his brother, uh, his brother, um, his brother's descendants, which were two nations. Um, so that's just a little bit of a thought here. I don't see any proof that this is talking about election to salvation. But I will say that I do I do see this, whatever this election is for, is unconditional. But there's just an assumption that it has to do with salvation. All right, we're going to look at Romans 11, 28 and 29 here again. And I just noticed something. Let's read it. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts are the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, is this talking about uh, the election we saw earlier as Israel? Is this saying that they are enemies of the gospel, but are beloved for the sake of the fathers? Um, we do know that Israel in, a, in general did reject the gospel, but we need to look at some context here to see, because I'm just thinking about the. I, I'm actually walking through this blindly. I mean, I've heard a lot of people talking about it, and I'm convinced, um, but I want to make sure, and I want to be very honest of what I'm seeing in the text. So is this election talking about those concerning the gospel that are enemies for your sake? Or is the election something different? So we need to look at a little context here in Romans 11 to see if that's what, what that's saying. Because if it is, that's pretty telling that obviously election is not uh, has nothing to do with the gospel, in, or at least in terms of that they received the gospel. Right, we're going to start at the beginning of this chapter, Romans 11, verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? Now, Real quickly, I'm going to go back to the end of chapter 10 and see who his people is that he's talking about here. We're looking at the last three verses of Romans 10. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So Israel is who is being talked about here. So going back to Romans 11, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Now, his People, we saw in a previous passage that the election is Israel, the elector Israel. Um, but now it's saying, has he rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have diminished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? Now, this is a, a prophet who was persecuted by his own people. 
uh, that he was prophesying for. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men whom have not but bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So now it seems to be talking about something a little different in the sense of you know, by grace, it's talking about those who did not bow the knee to, to to Baal, and it's talking about grace. So this is not talking about the children, the offspring of Abraham, but a remnant of them. And so let's keep reading, because this is, uh, you know, so far, maybe it's talking about salvation. Let's see. Verse 7, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Now, he's talking about a lot of the Israelites were hardened. And uh, this is another, another thing that is used. Um, or it says the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. So that apparently there's that not all Israel is elect, according to this passage. So, you know, I want to be very true to the text. I'm not trying to push uh, a doctrine here. I want to... I want to look at it carefully. So the elector uh, obtained it, but the rest were hardened. So, uh, yeah, the question is, the election that we saw earlier, which was Israel, um, is that the same election here? <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's keep reading. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall, fail? I can't read fall. By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. So it seems that they're hardened for a purpose. It says through their tre trespass. Now there's going to be an assumption that their trespass was caused by God. So um, I'm, I'm not convinced of that. So let's keep going. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then, because he's talking to the Romans, so they're Gentiles, uh, Roman Christians, inasmuch then I am an apostle of the Gentiles. So he's not only a, a, a Israelite, but he's also an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. So you see, those hardened Jewish people that have rejected the gospel, the hope is that they would be saved uh, in order somehow to make the, them jealous so that they might be saved. So this hardening is not about um, them not being elect or not, you know, not having an opportunity to get saved. So let's keep reading. For, their, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So uh, there are just a few thoughts that I noticed there. Um, this is kind of difficult stuff, but I noticed that the hope in rejecting the Jewish people is that they would come back to Christ, that they would uh, believe. I would like to correct what I just said because I'm trying to stay as tight with Scripture as I can. 
uh, as it states exactly. So when I said that they believed, uh, the verse I was looking at or looking for is verse 14. In order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. So you, now we're talking about salvation. So that's true. So you have the elect, and then you have the rest that have not been elect, yet the hope is that even they would get saved. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Uh, I'm going to pause real quick. So he's talking about uh, branches from Israel, the, the Jewish people being cut off that were not, non, that didn't believe they were non-elect or whatever, however you want to say that. And the, the Gentiles are now being grafted in. Um, now it says, but then it says, be, be, don't be arrogant. And it says that the root is what supports us Gentiles, as opposed to the Gentiles supporting them uh, being the root. So that is, let's see, then you will say branches were broken off so that I may be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief but you stand fast through faith. That's a key phrase there. You stand fast through faith. And um, so do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will be cut off. And even they, if they did not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. But God has the power to graft them in again. Interesting. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? So this is kind of all interesting stuff. Basically, the, the people that were cut off, um, and, and it's interesting because it said, I believe it said not all Israel... Uh, Many of the Israelites were not elect, and they were cut off. And now it says they could be grafted back in, and that we can be cut off. Um, okay, into a cultivated olive tree. Now, when it, when it says we're cut off, the Gentiles, remember, there were believing Israelites, believing people, children of Israel. Um so it's not necessarily individualistic, but that the light bearer of the truth, which was Israel, was cut off in general. And now the light bearer is the church, which is mostly Gentile, you know, people. Um, so maybe that's what it's talking about. If it's more corporate rather than individualistic, um, I would have to assume so. But then it says some branches were cut off. So the root, um, yeah, I don't know. This is interesting. Um, but it's, it's, we're getting to the context here of what we're talking about. Um, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. Notice it says partial until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. 
Now, this seems to be talking about salvation. And there's different perspectives on the future of Israel. You know, are they all going to turn to Christ uh, at some point in the future? I don't know. It seems to be indicating that. Now, we don't want to get sidetracked with that, but I'm trying to be as true to the context as I can as we get to this uh, proof text. I think we're getting there where it's talking about the elect again. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your, uh, for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their for forefathers. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so I, I looked at that verse out of context and considered that because I was aware that this book, I, I mean, I, I knew Romans is talking about uh, why many Israelites have rejected uh, their Messiah and um, or why God's people have rejected their Messiah. And I assume that might be what it's talking about. And sure enough, it's saying, they are enemies of the gospel. Like this, God's chosen people are the enemies, and yet they are regarded uh, election. They are beloved for the sake of their fathers. As regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Interesting. So once again, what is the election for, you know, uh, it seems like these people are elect and yet they're rejecting the gospel, but then they'll be grafted back in. So anyway, uh, verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. Let me pause real quick. I don't think this is talking about. Um, uh, I, OK, let me let me just say. Um, I don't know that this is talking about salvation. Let's see, you've received mercy because of their disobedience. Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how that would affect us by other people disobeying. I'm just trying to think about this for a second. Um, I think it has more to do with God's, uh, the people God is using as his, as his light bearers on the earth. Um, and now he's giving mercy to Gentiles. Uh, I don't, again, um, that mercy is still available for people that are children of Israel. And many of them have come to Christ. And so I'm trying to look at this as objectively as possible and say, what is this talking about here? I know we're talking about God's elect, the uh, Jewish people and the Gentile believers. Um, but uh, I guess because they are, that right now they are not the light bearers. So again, when we looked at verse four and five, I believe it was, and it talked about, or maybe that was chap, a different chapter, but um, when it was talking about election and it said the purpose was to carry the law and, uh, and a list of other things, I don't remember. Um, is that possible that those things are now being carried out by Gentile, the, the church basically? So it's it's a different with the church, which is all nations, um, and Israel as a nation. Judaism has rejected the Messiah, right? So I'm I'm looking at this kind of corporately now to make kind of some sense out of it, and um, and because, like, if I were to fall away from the faith it doesn't mean that somebody else would take my place, right? But if it's talking about the corporate Israel, just like earlier when we were talking about Jacob and Esau, it's talking about the nations and not necessarily the individuals, right? Um, perhaps that is um, something to consider here as well. Um, 
for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. I need to look up that word. Irrevocable, not able to be changed, reversed, or recovered, final. Interesting. Uh, then it says he can reverse it. Anyway, quite deep stuff here. Uh, I'm not sure I understand all this, but um, where am I? For just as you were once, so they have, to, so they too have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has cons consigned to all, consigned all to disobedience, that He may have mercy on all. Now I assume all means all nations in this context. Uh, on the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, and how inscrutable His ways. For as He for who has known the mindset of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Now back to the topic at hand, um, going through those chapters, I get a sense that election is not necessarily about salvation. It's about carrying the, the you know, being the light bearer for God on the earth and carrying the truth. And I want to go back to that that verse that we saw earlier. Uh, verse 4 and 5. I can't remember which chapter that was. Romans 9, starting in verse 4. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from the, their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Is it possible we're talking about that being taken away from them and given to the church? Now, there are certain things in this list that wouldn't make sense, such as uh, uh, from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Now, that is not true of the Gentiles, obviously. Um, but we are the ones that received the Christ. But we could say that the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises— um, that we continue to spread to all people, uh, perhaps. I don't know. Like, th this is interesting. Like, is it talking about salvation? Um, I don't know. Because these, it's talking about hardened people that can be grafted back in. It's talking about people that can be cut off and all that. It's, it's kind of weird language if you're talking about unconditional election. What were they cut off for if it's unconditional? You know, so I, I want to look at another passage here real quick and um, talk about if if we're talking about unconditional salvation, uh, I want to show a verse that shows why I don't believe that. And I think we've already looked at it before in a previous video. Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, uh, okay, let's uh, look at this for a second. Um, by grace through faith. So faith, I would say, is the condition by which we are saved, or by which we receive grace, I, I should say. And then it says, and that not of yourselves, it is, it, or not, not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. Now, um, I heard somebody explain it this way, and I'm not convinced. Uh, I believe it was uh, Beyond the Fundamentals, another YouTube channel. Uh, he believes that the gift of God is the grace and not, uh, or no, the gift of God is being saved and not the faith, which is interesting. Um, but but the way that I read this here is it seems to indicate obviously the grace is from God and obviously being saved is from God. So that speaks for itself. Nobody assumes that the grace is something on our own, that is something given to us, and that we're not saved 
by our own. The faith is the one thing that that we seem to think is is from ourself, and um, and then it says that is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Uh, now I want to make this very clear: faith is not a work. Faith is not a work. So you have to understand in the context here. We're talking about the Israelites believing that you must fulfill the law or obey the law to be saved. And it's saying, not as a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, what did he prepare beforehand? Um, well, it says we are his workmanship created in Christ. Um, we should walk in them. So I have to do some context digging there. But um, but yeah, I wanted to talk this about this. If, if it's talking about faith being the gift, and that's what I assume, based upon that's the only thing that we would do from ourselves. How would I, how would I consider that in my perspective? So I want to talk about the concept of a gift here for a second, because I think this is very important in in this context. So I do believe the faith is, is what it's talking about. The gift is is the faith. Somebody else said he believes it's beyond the fundamentals. I think said that he believes that the gift is salvation or being saved. But I th I think that goes without saying. The grace and the saving goes. Uh, without saying that those are from God or gifts from God. So what about the faith? So that not of yourself seems to indicate that it's talking about something that we would think was from ourself. Um, and I was thinking about this because it sounds like so far, it sounds like I'm kind of leaning towards this, that everything is to, is given to us by God, which is true. I cannot breathe. I cannot lift this hand up. I cannot do anything without God. But I wanted to consider this for a second. Okay, let's talk about a gift. Let's talk about uh, anything that God gives people. There are people that have the, the gift to walk and to be able to do a job. Now, everybody's gifted differently on that regard, but I think unless you are disabled in some way to where you can't do anything. But there's a lot of people that have the gift to do a job. They can do hard labor. They can do simple things. They can, they're capable of doing fast food work or something simple. Uh, just about anybody can do that. But there's some people who are able to do that God gifted them with legs that they can walk and a mind that they can think. But they're lazy. They're lazy, so they don't use that gift. Or they're alcoholics or they're drug addicts or whatever. Now you could say, and this is how they would rationalize that, that they are unable, and this goes back to total depravity, right? That... Um, that because the hardness of their heart. So we already talked about the total depravity part, but now let's talk about a gift. They have the ability to walk. They have the ability to talk. They have the ability to think, but they have other issues, right? And because of those other issues, they are not willing to use that gift. I could also talk about, uh, there are people that are um, re-gifters, I was just thinking of a Seinfeld episode, <laughs> but, uh, you know, just because somebody gives me a gift doesn't mean I have to accept it or, or receive it. Is it possible that the gift of faith is, is available for all people? And, and that's what I wanted to talk about here. So, um, yeah, so, so in terms of, the faith being a gift from God does not 
assume that that gift is only given to the elect or to the predestined or, or these other words. And we'll look at some of those words here in a bit uh, because that is part of this discussion. But um, but yeah, so that, that was something I, I was thinking about there. But I believe that the condition of to receive the grace is through faith, which obviously we are unable to have faith unless God gives us that ability to do. But just because we don't use, there's people that don't use it doesn't mean that they don't have that available to them to use. Does that make sense? That's kind of how I think about that. Let me see if there's any more scriptures. Those Romans passages were pretty deep, and I had to get, dig into context to see what it's talking about, because those are strong proof texts for unconditional election and other for, parts of TULIP. And you really have to dig deep into what it's talking about to get an idea. And we already saw the idea of elect people being cut off and unelect people being grafted in. And then that the people cut off can be regrafted in. So again, I the way that that's all worded seems more corporate than individualistic to me. Uh, in the term, in terms of they are the light bearers, so the people in charge of of bearing the truth to the world uh, were cut off because the the majority of the leaders rejected them. And now the truth, the light bearers of truth are in are Gentiles mostly and the church. So, yeah, so that was some things um, that I found interesting in digging through that. And, um, you know, I thought about looking at calling and chosen and other things. And, and uh, there's plenty of passages for that. Some of these listed there have to do with chosen. And uh, uh, why don't we look at some of those as well? Because I, you know, the, the term on you is unconditional election. So I wanted to show what election was about. Now, I want to talk about one more passage. I, I don't remember seeing it. I think it might have been in there, but I may not have picked it because it didn't have the word elect. But this is exactly what we're talking about, and it's the probably the the mother load, the grandpapa of the proof text for unconditional election or uh, being arbitrarily picked uh, for salvation, basically. And so that is Romans eight twenty eight through thirty, and we're going to look at it here in a second. Right now, actually, <laughs> Romans eight. Starting in verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, I'm going to pause there because what we're asking the question is, uh, there's some people that say this means that God causes all things to take place. Uh, let's, let's think about that for a second. All things work together for good uh, for those for to uh for sorry uh that those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose now let's think about that for a second i'm 50-50 on that verse you could look at that and say god uses all things that take place for the good or god causes all things to take place for the good and um for those who are called according to his purpose. So the verse does not say whether God causes everything to take place or he just uses things that take place for the good. So theologically, I'm 50-50 on that. Now, this is the mother load, the 20, verse 29 and 30, that seems to indicate arbitrarily selecting people for salvation, also known as unconditional election. Let's read these verses through, and then we'll kind of walk through it. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those 
whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, the question is, where does faith take place? Where does belief take place in this, in this passage? Because if you notice, it's not mentioned here. So depending on the systematic theology, I'm bringing up that word again, somebody would have to assume where faith takes place. And, and so we're going to walk through it and ask the question, where does faith take place? For those whom he foreknew. Now, I've heard three different definitions of foreknew. One is the most commonly taught, and the one that I thought for a long time is that God knows the future. Now, there's, there is a theology known as open theism where they say God does not even know the future. <laughs> I, I am not that. I do believe God knows the future. I believe God knows all things that will take place. Now, if that's the definition of it, it doesn't conclude that God causes all things to take place. There seems to be an assumption that just because God knows the future doesn't mean, or, or somehow that concludes, they think it means that God causes all things to happen. But I don't think that, you know, logic stands. I think that you can know... Um, just like I can know the past, it doesn't mean I caused the past to happen. There are certain things that I did cause to happen, I guess, by my own actions. But there's a lot of things I know about in the past that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> so, but I know they happened. So likewise, God can know the future and not necessarily cause it to happen. Does he allow it to happen? Sure. Now, there's two other definitions. So, well, let me just say, if that is the correct definition, knowing the future, I'm 50-50 on it. So, so far, knowing the future does not necessarily mean he causes the future, right? And then the question is, is that if that's talking about knowing the future, then faith could either take place right after that and before predestined or after predestined, we don't know. Uh, so if that's the definition, I'm 50-50 on it. Now, there's two other definitions I have heard. The second one, actually the most recent one I've heard, is for new means know before, but not chronologically, but in status. And I, I heard that just yesterday or the day before. I'm not convinced of that, but I think that was kind of an interesting take. And um, so he would say that that means that, like, the children of God, God places before the non-believers, right? So if that's the de definition, which I'm not convinced of, then the foreknown are already believers. So belief comes before being foreknown or known no, like those who God knows before all others, right? Sets before all others. That, that would be a definition. If that's the definition, then belief takes place before that, which completely goes 100% to the uh, provisionist side. That is that belief was the condition to be foreknown and everything else after this word. Uh, the third definition, which is the one that I hold now, is that foreknow means no before, just like the last guy, but it is chronological, but it's talking about the old covenant believers, uh, those who believe God before Christ came. And so that's kind of an interesting look at it. And at first, I thought that was a little bit of a stretch. But there's a reason, more than one reason that I believe that that is what it's talking about. And let me look at another verse that uses the word for no here and, and show you that, that that other verse cannot mean 
foretelling the future. Sorry for the blurriness here, but uh, the Greek word is pro proegno for new. And I'm going to click on this bottom one uh, or the third one on the right side. That's a longer word, but it's the same root word um, to see how it's defined elsewhere. It is a different form of the same root word. And to be fair, uh, I want to be completely fair with this as I go through it. The previous video, I did use a word that had a different root word. And I said, well, it's a different root word. So uh, this doesn't prove anything in and of itself. It is just interesting that it is the same root word. And so I had this, I heard this argument made by others, same root word, pro, but it's prognoscantes or something like that. And in Acts 26, 5, and even in 2 Peter, uh, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard. Uh, that seems to be ahead of time. But in Acts 26, 5, it's, it's that same word but used um, that uh, these people have known something for a long time. Let me look at the whole verse so, you, so I can show you what I'm talking about. Starting in verse 4, uh, Acts 26, verse 4, My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. Now, it is important to note this is Paul speaking, the same guy that wrote Romans. They have known for a long time. That is the phrase that is from that word. Uh, if they are willing to testify that according to the st in strictest part of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. So he's using that same word to refer to the Pharisees as knowing for a long time. So once again, that's two different forms of the same Greek root word. And I don't want to be dogmatic about that, but I just, I've heard that from several people that I respect and I consider that. And there's another reason that I think that for new in this context means those whom he knew beforehand or in the past. Uh, first of all, the context in Romans is talking a lot about the God's chosen people and the Gentiles, the Jews and the Gentiles, and um, and why the Gent the Jews have largely rejected the Messiah, and so um, but he's talking about those who died in the faith uh, is is one argument that the foreknew is the context like the context of the rest of the book. It makes perfect sense. Uh, so there's another reason, and I'll get to that in a second. For those whom he foreknew. Now, again, the three definitions of foreknew, two and a half of those favor the side that I take. That is that belief comes before the foreknowing. Or at least half of it is that the belief takes place right after foreknew, but before predestined. Um, that is that God knows the future. Um, but only half of those three definitions, or at least there's a tie on that first definition, would suggest that foreknew comes after, or faith comes after foreknow. <laughs> so, so at this point, I'm two and a half out of three on the side that faith comes before, for, or two out of three that faith comes before foreknew, and half out of three that faith comes right after foreknew, but before predestined, or half out of three, that faith comes after foreknew and after predestined. <laughs> so, sorry, that was confusing. But I'm trying to say that percentage-wise, uh, I'm still like probably at least two-thirds on my favor on this issue. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So reading all that together, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, what are they predestined to? To, to have faith? No. To be conformed to the image of his son. 
Now, that to me is an interesting statement. It, it, like it seems that it should say predestined to have faith or predestined to be saved. But it says to be conformed to the image of, of his son. Who's going to be conformed? Believers, right? So either A, believers are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, or he's predestined people to believe and then be conformed to the image of his son. So either way, you have to insert the word belief in there. So I'm 50-50 on predestined on that part of the phrase. Um, so at this point, it's not 100% one way or the other. Uh, at very at best, I'm 50-50 on this, where faith takes place. Now, it's interesting, it says, to be conformed to the image of his son, which also which takes place after salvation. So you must be saved to be conformed to the image of his son. So belief happens somewhere in there. <laughs> now, this is the phrase that convinced me of the other definition of foreknew. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now think about that. I, I that phrase made no sense to me for a long time. If foreknew means of the future, God knowing the future, that means that people being predestined to be saved uh, or predestined for all time, people still being saved now. Uh, it doesn't seem to make sense unless you're talking about past, like the believers before Christ. And when Christ raised from the dead, they were the firstborn. Does that make sense? Or born again right at the resurrection of Christ were all the old covenant believers. So that phrase makes more sense in that context. But let's continue. Uh, verse 10, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Now, it doesn't say what they're called to. Now, you remember, uh, there's other verses. I, I think we may have looked at some where people are being called to ministry or to be the bearers. You know, uh, we even looked at that one. Many are called, but few are chosen, right? So called doesn't necessarily mean to salvation or to, to, to the gospel, although it could in this context, but it does, it's not clear. There's the assumption that the calling is to the gospel, to believe in the gospel. But it could be for to be part of, the, uh, part of God's people and be a light bearer to the world as well. So once again, I'm 50-50 on whether faith takes place before or after called at this point. And those whom he also, uh, those whom he called, he also justified. Now, this is a case that they would make and say, see, justified happens at salvation when you believe. Now, I'm going to link this up with the last one. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I heard one person make this argument. Uh, for, I think it's also beyond the, the fundamentals that made this argument. And I just wanted to mention it here real quick. And I'm, I'm not, I don't agree with this anymore, but I did for a while. It made sense for a while. He said that glorified happens at the resurrection when we get new bodies, glorified bodies. Now, it doesn't use the word bodies here. It just says glorified. And it's written in the past tense. So he, his point was, if that's a future event, but it's written in the past tense, then justified also could be a future event. Now, I looked at that and considered the possibility that justified happens at the, res at the uh, final judgment. So all believers will be justified at that moment and then given glorified bodies. So both of those are written in the past tense, but could be speaking about a future event. However, my only issue with that is that it would make more sense if it said he who uh, also justified and those whom he justified sorry sorry going back he uh, predestined he also called and those whom he called he also will justify and glorify 
In other words, if it is talking about a future event, it seems a, a kind of strange to be, you know, not include the word will or, you know, will be justified, will be glorified, would make more sense to, to say it that way. But if it's a past event, does it happen at the moment of salvation? Um, and, and there's a good argument for that being yes. But then I rethought this because I thought, well, if I'm going to use the definition that I was using at the beginning, those whom he foreknew as the believers in the old covenant, the believers before Christ came, then is it possible to say that this stuff, that they were not born again until Christ raised from the dead? And then that phrase where it says they will be the firstborn among many brothers could be referring to when Christ raised from the dead, all the old covenant believers were then born again or born, you know, in the spirit, so to speak. Uh, we did talk about John chapter one in one of the, I think it was the first video about being, or John chapter three, being born again, right? Being born of the spirit. So, is it possible that they became justified and glorified the moment that Jesus raised from the dead? And therefore, when Paul wrote this, it is a past event because this was after the resurrection of Christ. So interesting things to consider here uh, on this, ver on this uh, verse. And therefore... At the very least, this is a 50-50 passage and is not proof for unconditional election. We are now way past an hour, but uh, I did touch the surface on this topic of unconditional election, which I don't believe in. I believe that the condition for salvation is... Um, well, let me let me rephrase that. I do believe in unconditional election if you're talking about the light bearers of the world, the elect, uh, that is Israel, to bear the truth of God to the world. And also, they were elect to be the bloodline of which the Messiah, Jesus, would come. And so in that regard, it does say before they did anything good or bad, and that before the foundation of the world... Um, and some would say that before the foundation of the world was referring to Jesus and not necessarily the Israelites. But regardless, um, when it talks about election, it's talking about Israel, the nation of Israel, to be the light bearer of the truth and the, and the law and the covenants and the bloodline of which the Messiah would come. And therefore, Unconditional election is true if you're talking about that, but not if you're talking about salvation. Unconditional salvation is a different thing. And I showed some passages, we dug deep into some of them, and I would encourage you to dig deeper. And again, Mark, Mark, Mark <laughs> Mike Winger does a good job on Romans, as well as Dr. Layton Flowers. You can look at Beyond the Fundamentals. There's Provisionist Perspective is another YouTube channel. Uh, they probably do a much better job and they do a lot of videos on these things. I touched the surface on it. But my main point was in the verses that we looked at, the chapters we looked at that were, you know, none of them seemed to indicate that election was for salvation, but for a purpose. Now, if you're talking about unconditional salvation, my response to that is you're saved by grace through faith. Now, does it say even that is not of yourself? Yes, but I made the, it is a, well, it says that it is a gift from God, but I told you that not all gifts are necessarily used. So people can be given a gift and not use it. So just because it is a gift doesn't mean that all people aren't, don't have access to that gift. And um, now, can I prove that everyone has access to the gift? No, I can't. Uh, just like it can't be proven that they don't. <laughs> and can I prove that 
the lost are totally depraved until God opens their eyes and that God only opens the eyes of the elect or only opens the eyes of those who believe? Or does he give enough revelation to all people? I think I showed some verses in the previous video on that, that I think God does show himself to all people and he does desire all people to be saved. Um, so in that sense, in the same exact way, the fact that God desires all people to be saved, I believe God gives people every tool they need to say yes or no to God, that they can say yes, but they say no, many of them. So I have to believe, and there's no proof one way or the other. So theologically, I'm 50-50 on whether or not God gives the gift of faith to all people. Logically, I'm 100% that God gives the gift of faith to all people. So, like I said, on Romans 8, 28 through 30, which is the granddaddy of all these proof texts for unconditional election and total depravity, etc., that uh, theologically, I'm actually not 50-50. I'm probably more like 70-30 because that first word, is huge, the definition of four new. And two and a half out of three could be on the side against unconditional salvation. I want to rephrase that because they assume when they when the doctrine of unconditional election is assuming that election is to salvation. So I'm going to say unconditional salvation here. And um Two and a half out of three of those translations of four new or interpretation of the word four new uh, would be on the side that faith comes before predestination, but one half out of three. So that's like, what is that? More than two third chance that faith comes before predestination and Two third chance that it becomes that it comes before for new. So theologically, Romans eight twenty eight through thirty, I'm actually probably two thirds or more on the side that faith comes before predestination, and and before even for for knowledge, <laughs> for no. So uh, theologically, I'm more on the side of of a uh, what do you call it? Provisionism is the definition of that God provides the gift or offers grace to all people and gives the gift of faith to all people. And he desires that all be saved. Um, so two thirds, but 100 percent logically and the way that God is presented throughout Scripture, I'm on the side of provisionism. So in both cases, it favors provisionism. So even the heavy granddaddy proof text of them all, Romans 8, 28 through 30, I'm two-thirds a provisionist theologically. <laughs> so I just wanted to end with that chapter, and I know we're way over an hour. I try to keep these to about an hour, but that's what it took to get through this topic. So the next letter is I, sorry, L, limited atonement. And there's another name for that. A friend of mine texted me that, that. I don't think we'll spend a lot of time on limited atonement, so we'll probably be talking about the I as well, and maybe even the P. We'll see. I don't know. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that'll be the next video. All right. Thank you all, and have a wonderful day.